And we thank you for the word of God. We thank you for our pastor this morning. And God, we ask you to anoint him, bless him, give him the words that you want this morning. Spoke to your congregation. And we give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Brother Jay. If you will, turn with me to Revelation chapter 3. We'll be starting with verse 7. And we'll go through verse 13. I'm going to read from the King James Version. I also have the New American Standard here in front of me. But I'm going to read the first time through in uh, the King James Version. And I don't have 18 pages of notes today. I only have 14. So, (laughs) Uh, all right, Revelation chapter 3, verse 7 through 13 says, "And, And to the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy and true. He hath the key of David. He that hath the key of David, he hath opened, he that openeth, and no man shutteth. He that shutteth, and no man openeth. I know thy works, behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, thou hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before my feet, and to know that I have loved thee, Because thou hast kept my word, the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon the whole world, upon all the world. To them, uh, to, to, to try them that dwell on the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Behold, I come quickly. Notice that. I hold, I'm sorry, hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from God. And I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you for your anointing today as I bring forth the word. And I pray, God, not only for the anointing upon my mind to keep me focused and on my lips to to speak your word, but God, also upon the ears, which are the gates, to the heart of the people and upon the hearts of the people as they receive. God, I pray that you would find good ground in this house and, Lord, by Facebook and and on our church webpage. I pray pray that you find good ground and that everything that's spoken here lord that that everything would be of you and and everything god that is spoken would also be received and acknowledged and accepted lord by your people and help us to move forward in you we ask you these things in the name of jesus amen now you may be seated and before i really get started uh, I want to remind you that we have a lot of needs to pray about. I, I, I mentioned the nation. I didn't go into great details there. You know we have a very crucial election coming up. As a pastor, I'm not allowed to tell you who I'm voting for, but as an individual, I could. But I'm not going to. That doesn't matter. My point is we are the people of God. And we are told, according to the word of God, to pray for our leaders. Whoever wins, whoever gets in in, in, uh, in this year in, in, into the presidency uh, needs our prayers. But we need to be praying now and not wait until then. And we need to be a part of the solution, not the problem. So I say that and, and I ask you to, uh, to be very diligent to pray for our nation. Um, there are a lot of things going on. There are two storms that are headed toward the Gulf at the same time. They may or may not be upgraded by now to, to hurricane level. I don't know. They're saying that this could possibly be two hurricanes hitting the Gulf at the same time. Never has happened before. There's been storms, two storms in the Gulf, but not two hurricanes. And uh, I think that we have a right, according to the Word of God, to pray against those things. Now, if this is the judgment of God upon America, because California is burning down, um, then then we have uh, what we need to be doing, and this is what I feel called to lead you toward, is as the church, we need to be praying the prayer of repentance. 
Repentance is not just for those who don't know the Lord. That's the first step into your relationship with him is to repent of your sins and turn from your wicked ways. But the Lord said to his church, if my people which are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, their wicked ways, the church, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins and heal their land. So we... Revival must start, judgment must start in the house of the Lord, and, and we need to be a people who would repent of everything that we, have, uh, that we have partaken in that was ungodly. Daniel did this in chapter 9, and he is a perfect example. When we have our night of prayer, I want to talk a little bit about that before we get started because I want to help us to focus in, in, in the pattern that Daniel prayed. You can, be in, you can be in fasting between now and then if you'd like. Um, we need to pray, first of all, to repent of anything that we have been in that was wrong. No matter what it might be, we need to pray. Uh, we need to repent for the sins of our fathers. Some people think that we, that's kind of um, going out there and people have a, have a fit when you say that, uh, that we need to repent for their father's sins. But according to the word, that's what Daniel did. He repented for the sins of his fathers, the sins of his nation. And then he asked God to hear him and to move not for their righteousness, but for his righteousness, for his namesake. So that's the pattern that we need to pray uh, in, in this time. And I feel like God has called me to say that and, and, uh, and, and, and not only to say it to you, but um, very soon I, I want to do a, an online prayer meeting as well and have some other preachers from around the nation uh, to get involved in that. And I'll tell you more about that too, but not today. Um, let's get into the word. Uh, Revelation chapter 3 verse 7 through 19, I will go back to that quite a lot. I'm not going to read it again right this minute, but I'll go back to that quite a lot. And um, if there's room, go ahead and pull up, well, you could pull up verse 1. Do it verse at a time if that's not too much trouble. Go ahead and pull up verse 1, or not verse 1, but verse 7, first verse, and we'll come to that in just a minute. Um, let me very quickly tell you where we've been. We have been, this is the sixth church, so this is the sixth week that we've been talking about the churches of Asia, sometimes called churches of Asia, the, the churches of Revelation. Um, we're talking about the seven churches, and, and these are letters that are written down by John at the they're, they're written at the, at the command of Jesus. So John was transcribing the word that Jesus told him to speak to the churches. I told you throughout this series, we've got one more to go after today, that, that what, what was happening here is that God was speaking to those seven churches that were in Asia, which was really uh, Turkey now, Asia Minor at the time, um, he was speaking to them, and they are a representation of the entire church in the body of Christ, and I believe in the world. Were they real churches? Yes, I believe that they were. Um, were they, some people believe they were church ages. Are they representative of church ages? Probably. But still, there are individual churches that have these individual characteristics in the body of Christ today. Very few churches very few churches, two out of seven, were pleasing, really pleasing to God. Very few churches are like Philadelphia or Smyrna, and, and there, was, there was no negative report given to Philadelphia or to Smyrna. Um, Ephesus was a loveless church. They had left their first love. Smyrna was faithful, but they were about to go into persecution, and the Lord reminded them to be faithful during the persecution. Pergamos was a church that was in compromise. They were allowing compromise. Thyatira was falling for deception from Jezebel um, that called herself a prophet. So it was, it was spiritual deception. And then Sardis was a dead church. Probably the worst of all is to be called a dead church. Uh, Laodicea that we'll talk about next week is a lukewarm church. But today, we're on Philadelphia. Philadelphia was another faithful church like Sardis, but Philadelphia had already, from what I understand, they'd already been through a whole lot. They'd already been through a lot of persecution. 
Smyrna was about to go into persecution. Um, it, it appears to me that, that Philadelphia had already been through much persecution and they were, um, they were faithful. We've lost our screen. That's okay. After a certain while, it, it, it uh, shuts down. And to the angel of Philadelphia, write, These things saith he that is holy and true. To the angel of the church of Philadelphia, write, These things says he who is holy and true. I, wanna, I want you to catch this, and I'll go on. Um, how many of you know that the Lord is holy? And how many of you know that he's true? I don't think this needs a lot of explanation, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend just a minute on it. Holy means to be untainted by sin. Um, sin is actually to transgress or to break the law of God. But sin really is anything that's displeasing to God. Anything that doesn't match or meet his character. Anything that doesn't meet the character of God that we do and, and he is opposed to is sin. How many of you know that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God? How many of you know that it's, it's only by his grace that we can be saved? We, praise God. We, we, are not, we are not in and of ourselves worthy to be born again because we are sinful, sin-sick, um, repetitive sinners. But the blood of Jesus Christ, according to the word of God, has cleansed us from all sin. He has washed that sin away, and we are brand new creatures in Christ. We, old things have passed away, all things have become new. So we understand that, that when we're talking about holy, we are only holy. We are only holy by his holiness. But he is untouched by sin. He, he cannot sin. He is above sin. He doesn't do those things that are displeasing. How many of you do things that are displeasing to yourself? God doesn't do that. He's holy. I do too. I do things and I think, why in the world did I do that? Get very disgusted with myself sometimes. And I do it again anyway. But God doesn't do that. He is holy. He is untouched by sin. He's untainted by sin. There's no sin on his record. There's no spots on his robe. He is pure and holy. He's righteous. He is, he is set apart. He's the only one that has holiness like this. And then the word says that he is true. And, and really what this, what this is saying is that not only is he truthful, which is what we might think of, but he is authentic. Amen. He's authentic. He's not just some, some little G God that, that is a wannabe. And there's a lot of gods that are want-to-be's, including Lucifer, Satan, the devil. He's a wannabe, and that's all he is. He's not authentic. He wants to, he wants to uh, 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 ascend to the place of God, but he's not authentic. God is the original, and I'm not talking about Coca-Cola. God is the original. He is the one who was and is and is to come. And Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And, and I want us to understand, he is, he is holy, but he is also true. He's He's faithful to who he is, and he is, he is always the same God. He is, he's, 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 oh my goodness, he is amazing. He's an amazing God. He's authentic, he's genuine, he's sincere, he's real. My God is real. He's real in my soul. For he has washed and he's made me whole. His love for me is like pure gold. My God is real and I can feel him in my soul. I don't know why. Sometimes I just have to break into song. But God is holy and he is true. Now, He's speaking here, I'm going to go on here just a minute and talk about the, he, he hath the key of David and I'm going to spend some time there. But God is, God is speaking to the church at Philadelphia. I don't think I, I, I brought this out, I did, but I want you to understand I'm telling you on each of these, I'm telling you the names as best we understand them. We understand what Philadelphia means. Most of us know that it means uh, the city 
of brotherly love. And, and, and we know that. Uh, we have a Philadelphia here in the United States. But, but we, we may not understand the particulars about it. This, this church, I believe, represented that. We see that uh, e- e- Ephesus, in Ephesus, they, they had left their first love. They didn't love God like they should. They didn't love each other like they should. But this city was, was called Philadelphia. It wasn't named that for the church. But, the, but names are very substantial in the word of God. It was named that for uh, the king of, um, of that area. I believe it was still, this was still part of, of, of Lydia, the, the, the province of Lydia. And the king had loved, his, he loved his brother so much that he gave him this city and he called it Philadelphia. In other words, I love you, brother. Basically what he was, what he was calling it. And, and so we, we, we want to understand that it had a good name. It had a very good name. And this church was living up to that name. But they had had some difficulties. They'd had, uh, they'd had some, some troubles. Um, there, there, was a, uh, there was an earthquake which happened, I believe, about 90 years before this. Uh, I don't remember exactly how many years. And it's in my notes, but 14 pages is a lot to search when you're looking for a, something specifically. And, and this, this earthquake had nearly destroyed Philadelphia. And, and it, had, it had shaken uh, also Sardis. And, and I believe that at one point, maybe not that earthquake, but at one point Sardis was completely destroyed, had to be rebuilt. But Philadelphia had, had, had gone through some very, uh, some very strong earthquakes and had some difficulties. And from what history says, even at the time of this writing, they were having earthquakes and tremors on a regular basis. And so they were always, it seemed, on shaky ground. And that will come into play when the Lord is saying he's going to put them as a pillar in the temple. We'll talk about that in a little bit. We, we understand that they, they had... They had been faithful even though what seemed like a shaky situation. It seemed like everything that they looked at around them was was shaking. How many of you get the idea of what that must feel like in 2020? Everything around us seems to be shaking. And the word of God says that he will shake things again. And and so we're seeing, I believe that, we're seeing a time when God is is allowing things to happen. But he's not not trying to to destroy us. He's trying to bring us closer to him. I've told you before, all judgment is to point us to Jesus Christ. And so they had gone through some things and, and they had frequently had earthquakes and it may, it may have been that they, were, that they were accustomed to the shaking and so therefore they, they understood what, what faithfulness really meant. If, if, you, if you lived in a place that was always shaking, you would want a very stable, sturdy home. Amen? You wouldn't want to be gathered in a church that wasn't going to stand for long. You would, you'd, want to, you'd want to be sure that it was stable. They had found that in the spirit realm, that they had found that the only stable place was in Jesus Christ. And they had determined to stay faithful to him, and they were after his heart. Now, that gets us back on track. I needed to say those things, and I have a whole lot more that I could share there, but I'm going to skip it. But the Lord speaks to Philadelphia and he says to the angel of the church of Philadelphia, write, these things saith he that is holy and he that is true. He that hath the key of David that openeth and no man shutteth and shutteth and no man openeth. When, when I began to study this and, and I, I, told, I told some of them before, I've preached on these churches before. But God has revealed some new things to me this time, and I feel like this is the season for us to really understand what God is saying. We're trying to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. If we ever needed to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, it's right now. And, and so, as I said, I've preached on this before, but I haven't ever had the understanding that I have now. And I believe that that is, that is um, something that God has allowed. I know that 
he spoke to Daniel and told him to shut up the things of that book until the days of the end. And he also said, I believe it's in Daniel, the word also says that there would come an explosion of knowledge, and that's a paraphrase, but in the end. And so we're in the time that God, I believe, is revealing his word, and he wants us to see it, and he wants us to hear it. He wants us to know who he is and, and what he is speaking to his church. And it must, as we talked about with Thyatira, it must match what the word of God says even if someone has a word that they say is from the Lord Amen. if it's not a match for the word of God it's false Amen. it's false but I began to look for the key of David and to see what this meant and I'll just tell you that most of the I don't I don't use commentaries a whole lot because they're just man's thoughts but I, I do sometimes turn to them to try to help get some insight. And I'll look at four or five so I get an idea of what they're saying. But it, it seems that nobody had a, a really good understanding of the key of David. Not very many at all. Um, most everybody agrees that it refers to authority. You probably know that. A key represents authority. A key represents access. Um, my keys, I left them in my office. Tracy, got your keys? Oh my goodness, look at all these keys. Key, keys represent access. This key right here gives me access to the barn. We're not living over there now. We've not moved everything yet, but it gives me access to the barn. This key right here will open the door to our house the, the door that goes in the walk in through the door uh, at the garage um, this key is the door to the church the front door there are several more here one of those is a key to my office I don't know you don't have a key to my office my wife does not have access to my office <laughs> I'll have to fix that today I guess <laughs> I don't know all these, but they, they all have a purpose. This key is Lauren's car. She's probably watching online. The girls could not come home. This Okay, she's with singers, Lee Singers. But um, keys represent, they represent access, and therefore they represent authority. This says that he, Jesus is saying that he has the key of David. Now, I want us to consider this for just a minute. I thought about a lot of things as I was as I was studying it. There's only one other scripture in the word of God that I'm aware of that talks about the key of David and that's in Isaiah chapter 22 verse 22. And you might want to write that down and go there and look at that. And I'll get back to that in just a minute. But what does the key of David have to do with anything? Well, David had a covenant with God, and David was a man after God's heart. David was a person who, um, who, who God had, had placed in, you know, Saul was a king, but he was the king of the people. But God had placed David. God had anointed David, he had placed him as the king, and he had a covenant, God had a covenant with David that he would always have an heir upon his throne, that there would always be someone who would, who would be upon his throne. And this is, this is, a, this is a prophetic, um, really a, a, an introduction to Jesus Christ, saying that he would, he would be the, 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 the root of David, the descendant of, of David, and that he would be upon the throne of Israel. Now, we think about that, and we realize that Jesus didn't come as a king in the earthly, but in the, the, in, in the supernatural, in the, in the heavenly. He is king of kings and lord of lords, and he is the, he is the descendant of David, but he is also the heir to the throne of Israel, but also of the whole universe. He is, he is king of all kings so when we're talking about the key of David we have to realize that we're we're talking about governmental authority over the nation of Israel and and so he said 
and I'll go into more detail there in just a minute, but he said, he, he that openeth, speaking of himself, Jesus, he that openeth and no man shutteth, he that shutteth and no man openeth. So he's saying, I have the key, I have the authority, I have access, I can grant access, or I can deny access. Now this was not just natural, this was not just Israel, but it was also spiritual. Now, as I begin to study, I, I, I found some things out, and I want you to look at with me Isaiah chapter 22. And you, don't have to, you don't have to read it, but let me just get you to turn there. Isaiah 22, that's Old Testament. It's in the, the prophets, section of the prophets. Isaiah 22, and I believe verse uh, 15 is where I want to go, but I'll double check that. Thus saith the Lord of God of hosts, come, go to this steward, to Shivna, who is in charge of the royal household. What right do you have here, and whom do you have here that you have hewn a tomb for yourself here? You who hew a tomb in, on, on height, you who carve a resting place for yourself in the rock. Behold, the Lord is about to hurl you Headlong, O man, he is about to grasp you up firmly and roll you tightly like a ball and cast you into a vast country and there you will die and your splendid chariots will be, and there your splendid chariots will be. You shame your master's house. I will depose you from your office. I will pull you down from your station and it will come about that in that day I will summon my servant Eliakim the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with your tunic and tie your sash securely about him, and I will trust, entrust him with your authority, and he will become a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. And I will set a key, the key of the house of David, on his shoulder. When he opens, no one will shut it. When he shuts it, no one will open it. And I will drive him like a peg into a firm place, and he will become a throne of the glory to his father's house. Now, this is an Old Testament story that we're not very familiar with, and it relates to Jesus Christ. We see here that, that Shivna, and, and I know it's got a B, but I listened to Strong's on how to record, how to, how to pronounce that, and the Hebrew, they pronounce it like it's a V, Shivna. So this, this Shivna was an unfaithful servant to the house of King Hezekiah of Judah. And his, his position required him to be faithful to the king, but also gave him authority in the whole kingdom. And he had, he had misused his authority. This could be a representation of Adam, or it could be a representation of Satan who took the authority from Adam. But in any case, he was cast out and his authority was given to another. And, and uh, his name was Eliakim, I believe. Yeah, Eliakim. Eliakim, on the other hand, was a faithful man. And he was given... He was given authority according to the word of God. He was given the key of David so that he could open and he could shut. And when he opened, it wouldn't be open. When he shut, it wouldn't be shut. History says, and, and uh, this is not easy to find, but history says that, it says that the key would be placed on his shoulder. How many of you remember that Isaiah chapter, I believe it's chapter 9, speaking of Jesus, says that the government will rest upon his shoulder. He should be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace, Everlasting Father. It's, it speaks of government resting upon his shoulder. That key is a representation of, of government, of authority, of, of access, of rights. And, and it was taken from Shivna and it was given to Eliakim. It was taken 
taken from an unfaithful servant. Perhaps we, we, we again, perhaps Shebna represents Adam. But we, we, we see that it was given to Eliakim. And Eliakim is a representation in the Old Testament of Jesus Christ. He had the right to all of the house of David. Now this was far after David. This was when this was when Hezekiah was king, but they still called it the house of David. Ju- Jerusalem was called the house of David. And and so he had the right to everything of of the king. Every all of the aspects of the king's goods, all of the access to the king's home, the access to all of the the the, the supplies of the whole nation. If the army needed something, they had to go through Eliakim if if the builders needed something they had to go through Eliakim he had authority he had he had right he had the right to the authority and he carried that key according to to tradition he carried that key on a large ring upon his shoulder I don't know if it was left or right but it could be seen by everyone who saw him. So they saw that he had the right. They could see that the key was his. And he then had the right to take the key and to open. And if he opened it, you had access to it. If he closed it, you didn't have access to it. Again, I tell you this is a, a figure of Jesus Christ. It's a foreshadowing of the authority of Jesus Christ. This was in the natural But God has given Jesus the right in the natural and in the spiritual that he has the right to open and he has the right to close. In Eliakim's case, if you wanted to see King Hezekiah, you had to go to him and you had to ask, can I have an audience with the king? He was his most trusted assistant. In the case of of who can be saved or have access to God, there's no other name whereby men must be saved except Jesus Christ. We have to understand that Jesus Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. He has access into the highest places of the kingdom. And no one else can let you in there. And no one else can keep you out. Hallelujah. That's what the key of David is all about. We've wondered about that for years. I've wondered about that for years. And praise God, I believe this is a revelation. And the body of Christ needs to understand that. And I'm going to talk just a little bit more about it. Because Jesus went and every key that was that was in the the hands of Satan he went into the pits of hell and he took the key of death of hell and the grave he took every every bit of authority every bit of right that had been handed him by Adam Jesus took it back from Satan and he said now you have no authority and he took those keys and he gave them to Peter representing the body of Christ and we have been given the keys to the kingdom of heaven I know I'm getting loud, guys. I'm trying not to, but I'm excited. The keys to the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said to Peter, I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And, and some people would say, well, he gave that to, to Peter. And Peter was the, was the first pope and all these things. And I want to say Peter was, Peter was a... He, he was a good representation of, of mankind. He was, he, was, he, he, he was loud. He was obnoxious at times. He was crass. He was into trouble all the time. And he was a good representation of mankind. He was no good for nothing without Jesus Christ. But Jesus saved him and redeemed him. And so when he gave the keys, he used Peter as a representation for all of his disciples, all of the body of Christ, and he gave him the key. Peter would have been the last one that I would have wanted to give the key to, but he had seen the change that had come in him because of the power of his Holy Spirit. And I want us to understand that if we will walk uprightly before God and allow his Spirit to change our hearts and our minds and our lives, then God will allow us to operate with the keys of the kingdom and to unlock things that he's already unlocked in heaven and to lock things up that he's already locked in heaven. That's what the Word says. He said he's given us the power to bind and to loose. This is all related to the key of David. He's given us the power to bind and to loose. We have understood that to mean that we could say what we really wanted and we could could loose it or we could bind it. 
And, and, and I want us to understand what the true meaning of that is. If we really look that up in the original language, it's saying, it doesn't say, he, he isn't saying, I'm just giving you this power flippantly. He's saying that whatever you bind on earth, it says shall be bound in heaven. The original language means it, it must have already been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth must have already been loosed in heaven. He's saying, I'm giving you the authority to act as a representative of Jesus Christ on this earth. Jesus has already taken the keys. Jesus already has the authority. Jesus has already opened heaven. But I'm giving you the keys to act on his behalf. You have the right to go into the world as missionaries and to declare the gospel of Jesus Christ and see the whole world turn to him. You have the right to take authority over the darkness in your region and declare that it must come down we have the right if we if we are on good terms with Jesus Christ Jesus has revealed himself I told you it's important how he reveals himself to these churches he has revealed himself as he who has the key of David that openeth And no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. He's revealed himself this way to this church. In other words, he's saying, really he's saying, I have all authority. And I have, I have, he he goes on the very next thing, I've, I've, I've said, I've opened a door for you. And no man can shut it. He said, I have given you access. Nobody can take this away for you. What was that door? We don't know exactly. It could have been doors. Doors represent opportunity. Opportunity, they say, only knocks once. But he had given them... He had given them an open door. Perhaps it represented opportunity. I believe if it did, it was an opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. It could have been related to the shaking that was going on. Nobody felt safe. Nobody felt, nobody felt secure. And they had a word that went beyond the shaking. Church, I'm telling you, that's where we are today. Nobody feels safe. Nobody feels secure. I understand that. We can't in the natural. But we have to realize that in Jesus Christ, whatever comes my way, I'm more than a conqueror through him who strengthens me. And in Jesus, my life on this earth is as a vapor, the word says, but this is not all of it. I have been given eternal life and and, and beyond this, I will live forever in his presence. So I don't need to be so uptight about what's going on around me that I can't use this opportunity, this open door to be who Jesus has called me to be and to be what he has called me to be the door is open and he's saying to them the door is open it could have been a door of victory the Lord says if you're faithful and they were faithful if you're faithful over a few things I'll make you ruler over many he may have been saying you have a door right now and you've been faithful you're walking through that door and if you will continue then I will bless you that's what he told Smyrna he's saying here he's saying here I have the keys I have the authority nobody else has it nobody else has the right to it I can I can open doors I can close doors you remember the apostle Paul said that he had a door of opportunity that was opened in Macedonia God is the one who gives us opportunity I believe with all my heart we have a door of opportunity right here at South Knoxville Church of God. God has opened us a door of opportunity. The the devil might be trying to close it, but he can't close what God has opened. We can't open what God has closed, but the devil cannot not close what God has opened. We need to understand that. Whatever we face, God is bigger. Whatever we're going through, no matter who is the president after the election day, God has opened a door, and as, as of right now, it's still open, and he is not going to allow anybody else to close it. Amen? Amen? It's his door, it's his keys. And he's opened it. 
I, I, I told some, and this is not a political statement, this is a spiritual statement. I believe that God has given us, I said this in 2016, God has given us a space of time. I don't know how long it is. I don't know if it's four years. I don't know if it's eight years. I don't know if it's 16 years. But God has given us a space of time. And whatever we do with this open door really boils down to our faith and our determination. I am determined to do all that I can for Jesus Christ while I have breath in this body. I've missed opportunities. I've missed lots of opportunities. I'm ashamed of the opportunities that I've missed. I'm ashamed of them, but I've missed them. They're gone. Can God open those doors back up to me? Yes, he can, but only he can. But I'm ashamed of those opportunities that I've missed. But because of that, I don't want to miss any more opportunities that Jesus has offered me. And this is what he's saying to this church. I have set before you an open door and no man can shut it. For you have a little strength I have kept my, and have kept my word and have not denied my name. The Lord has opened a door. Praise God. I want to read that again. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Notice that the faithfulness of Philadelphia came into play here. See, God has the right to open the door, but he doesn't just open the door for anybody. God is looking for a faithful church. He didn't open a door for Sardis. He told them they were dead. He didn't open a door for Thyatira. They were being deceived by, by a woman who called herself a prophet. Spiritual deception. He didn't open a door for these other churches because they were not, they were not at the point to be open. Even, he didn't even open a door for Smyrna. Or it doesn't say that he does. But they were about to go into persecution and he told them to be faithful. But he opened the door here for Philadelphia. Now, I want to read on. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan. Which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them come and worship before thy feet and know that I have loved thee. Behold just means look. And usually it's, it's uh, when you say behold, it's, it's with some excitement. You don't say, behold. You say, behold. In other words, look. This is, this is powerful. This is something that you need to be taking notice of. Behold. I will make them of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. What was, what was happening here was there was a group of people who Jesus is calling the synagogue of Satan. Synagogue means gathering. Satan means adversary. The gathering of adversaries against the body of Christ. This was a synagogue of Satan. I think he uses the word synagogue because it's pr very probable, as this says, they say they are Jews, but they are not. This could have been people who were of the natural lineage of, of Abraham, or it could have been people who claimed to be Jewish uh, because of their practices or whatever, but they weren't. We, we're not certain of who they were, but we are certain that they were a gathering of Satan because that's what Jesus said of them. He said, who, who say they are Jews and they're not. Sometimes people who are of the natural lineage of, 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 of Abraham basically will call themselves Jews, but what the word Jew comes from is, is praise. Judah 
is where the word Jew comes from. Judah is a people of praise. This could have even been saying these people say that they are a people of praise, but they're not. So somebody, a group of people, perhaps Jewish people, by, by nature or by, by descendant, descendancy, but perhaps a people that had descended from Abraham or perhaps a people because of their, their worship style had claimed to be Jews. They had claimed to be people who, who were a people of praise. They claimed to have relationship with God. They claimed to be the ones who were in touch with God, but Jesus said they were not. Again, I don't know who these people were, and I don't know what they stood for and what, they, what, the, what their, 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 their worship styles were. I don't know if they were natural Jews or if they claimed to be Jews because of their worship style. I don't know any of that, but what I do know is that Jesus said that they were not Jews, and he said that he would make them come and worship before the feet of those who had, who had loved him. Let me go back to the scripture. He said, I will make them a synagogue of Satan. In other words, I will, I will turn them over to that. They're a gathering of the enemy. And I will turn them over to the adversary. Because they're a gathering of the devil. This is, uh, uh, by the way, this is the second reference to the synagogue of Satan. We also saw that, saw that in Revelation 2 when we saw Smyrna. So, both of the churches that were persecuted were dealing with who Jesus called the synagogue of Satan. Here's what my point is about this, and this is what I believe. It doesn't matter if they were natural descendants of Abraham or if they were not, but what they, they called themselves Jews. In other words, they called themselves people of praise. This came from the religious community. The persecution in Smyrna, the persecution here in Philadelphia was coming from the religious community. Others who called themselves people who were in relationship with God were bringing about persecution on the true church. And I'll just tell you that sometimes it's the Christian, the so-called Christian, who give you the most difficult times, who cause you the most persecution. Jesus dealt with the Pharisees, and they claimed to be the sons of Abraham, and yet they they and they thought they had the corner the, the market cornered on relationship with God, but yet he called them a brood of vipers. So we see that that religion has really no place in Christianity. Excuse me if that messes up your theology, but religion has no place in Christianity. Christianity is about relationship with Jesus Christ. Christianity is not about a pattern of worship. It is about relationship with Jesus Christ. And, and because of our relationship with him, we have access to the Father. If we're about religion, we'll get prideful. If we're about relationship, we will be humbled. Jesus has no reason to love me. But he does. Therefore, I'm humbled. He didn't have to save me, but he did. But if I began to think, look at me. I am a Christian. I'm a preacher. Some would be able to say, not me. I've gone to seminary. I know I know how to read the Bible in Greek and in Hebrew. I, I know all the 613 laws of the Old Covenant. I can quote them to you and tell you where they're found in the Scripture. I can quote to you the entire book of Revelation. I want us to understand if we're not careful, we'll get into a religious spirit. 
and the religious spirit that was operating in Philadelphia, the religious spirit that Jesus came in contact with, the religious spirit, as a matter of fact, was exactly what caused Jesus to be crucified. He came with the intent of dying, but it was the religious people who put him to death. It was the religious people who killed him. I want us to get out of the idea that I have to be religious, but get into the idea that I have relationship. If I know God through Jesus Christ, my life will change and I'll become holy because he makes me holy and he'll call me out of my sin and he'll call me out of my shame. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. They say they're Jews, but they're not. So Jesus is basically saying, he says, Behold, I will make them come and worship, worship at thy feet and know that, that I have loved you. I have loved thee. He's basically saying, I'll take care of it. <laughs> How many times did Jesus tell us things like, turn the other cheek or forgive 70 times 7 or when men speak evil of you to be joyful how many times did he say it's just over and over and, and, and basically this is reminiscent of that he's saying they're persecuting you and they're making your life difficult but you've been faithful you've not bowed your knee to another you are being faithful to me He's saying, I'll take care of it. My grandma, used to, my grandma used to say that I, 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 this person has done this to me, but I'm not even raring. I'm not even raring up at them. <laughs> what she was saying probably was that I really want to in my flesh, but I'm trying to keep my peace and let God fight this battle. If I hold my peace and let the, for, the Lord fight my battle. See, we, we have to realize that God will take care of it. It doesn't matter who's giving you a difficult time. It doesn't matter if they are the religious people. It doesn't matter if they call themselves Jews, if they call themselves the church. It doesn't matter if that's the people that's giving you the hard time. If you will stay true to Jesus and his word, he will deal with it. He'll deal with it. If we don't stay true to Jesus and his word, he'll deal with us. He told these other churches, five of the, the six other churches that we've talked about, he, he's told them over and over, if you don't do this, I'll do that. He's telling them to, to repent. He's telling Ephesus to go back to their first love, do your first works over. We have to realize that if we will be faithful like this church here, Philadelphia, that God will fight our battles. Be faithful. And he says that they will come and bow down at your feet and know that I've loved thee. One commentary I looked at, is, and, I, and this is one of my favorites, is John Gill's exposition of the whole Bible. He says that this was um, speaking of the conversion of these Jews. He says the sense is that that the convinced and convicted Jews shall come to the church in the most lowly contrite manner, in the most lowly contrite manner, acknowledge, acknowledge their former blindness, be furious in their zeal, and, 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 have, and, and, and recognize that they had violent hatred against Christians, and they shall profess the Christian faith. That may be the case, or it may be not, I don't know. But I do know that the Lord was speaking here that he would humble those who were causing the church, his church, trouble. I thought it was interesting, and I'm, I'm, I'm getting pretty close to the end here, but I thought it was interesting that Smyrna was, was told that they, were, they had been faithful, but remain faithful as you're going into these troubles and be faithful unto death and there will be a crown of life and and here Philadelphia 
is, is, is considered by God to be faithful. And, and the Lord is speaking here about those who are giving them trouble and he's saying he'll deal with it. Here's the thing. We may face persecution. We may go into trouble. We may face trials. We may face hardship. But if we do, we should do it as Christians, not as earthly man. We need to do it as the Holy Spirit has instructed us from the Word. We need to stay close to Jesus and let God deal with that person or those people or that that government or whatever if, if at all possible because this will bring glory to God but it will also lay up for us treasures in heaven he goes on to say because thou hast kept the word of my patience or in other words because you have obeyed my command to persevere you can see that in some of the newer translations and understand it from that new living says because you have obeyed my command to persevere because you have kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon the whole world. And, I'm sorry, the whole world to try them that dwell upon the earth. I, I, I want to point this out, and this is a shouting point, I believe. And if you want to shout, that's just fine. You go ahead. But what the Lord is saying here to the church of Philadelphia is completely opposite of what he was saying to Thyatira. To Thyatira, who had listened to the false prophetess Jezebel, he said to that angel or to that pastor, he said, I will cast her and all those who commit fornication with her into great tribulation. This means the compromised church, the church that will not stand for truth, is going to go through trouble that that is is the the greatest of trouble and those who are those who are faithful although they will have persecution will not have to go through great tribulation i believe with all my heart this is speaking i believe in, in, in the way i see this this scripture is the most compelling argument that the church will already the true faithful church will already be called out of here before great tribulation begins on this earth and i praise god for that because I've already had enough of this world. I don't need any more. I am looking forward to the day that Jesus Christ splits those eastern, eastern skies. And I'm even saying, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Come on and get your people. I believe, and this is perhaps my opinion, but I believe it's clear here in the word of God. He says, because you have kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world and they that dwell upon the earth. I believe this is talking about great tribulation and he has told the compromised church that they will be cast into great tribulation, but he's telling the faithful church, I'll keep you from it. The word says over and over, in, in, in many different ways that we are not appointed to wrath. We are not the children of wrath. And here he's saying to the church at Philadelphia that I will keep you from the hour of tribulation that's coming upon the earth. I believe the Lord is saying because of the faithfulness and this is why this is another one of those reasons why I believe that this was not just to the church that 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 resided in Philadelphia in in Lydia it was it was also for churches that that have existed throughout history because the Lord has also as we know according to his word he has taken some people out early because he was saving them from the things that were to come the word tells us that it's Isaiah chapter 57, I believe. It said, the righteous perishes. And no man takes it to heart that God is, is, is preserving them from the evil that is to come. So all throughout history, there were some things that were going to happen that God has pulled people out. But I believe with all my heart that he's saying here to the church that is alive today, if you'll be faithful, I will take you out before it gets too bad that you cannot handle it. The word of God tells us that we all have to face troubles and trials and he even tells us to, to face them with joy and to experience our troubles and our trials 
smiles with joy. But he said, with every temptation, I've made a way of escape. And so if we're in a spiritual battle, he has made a way through Jesus Christ that we can get out of those troubles. But I also believe that it's true that as great tribulation comes upon this world, I believe he's going to take his church out of this place and we'll just let those who want it have it because we are going to go celebrate the marriage supper of the Lamb and we are going to glorify the King of Kings. So now you know if you didn't already where I stand on pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. I believe, I believe we're right at the edge, honestly. If, if, if Jesus was coming after the tribulation to catch his church away. And he is coming after the tribulation to, to set things right. Coming in his glorious appearance. But he was, if he was coming after the great tribulation to catch his church away, we would have seen all these things happen and we would know he's going to be here any minute. We'd know it. But he said he was coming like a thief. But he also said that we are not children of the night that we should be caught unaware. We are seeing what's happening in this world. And so the Lord is coming either before the great tribulation starts, or, or bef- let me say it this way, before the tribulation starts or before the great tribulation starts. Some say that the great tribulation is that three and a half years, the last part, and the seven years are tribulation. I don't know. I can't tell you that. But Jesus is coming to get me, I believe with all my heart, and to get you if we will remain faithful. He's coming to get us before he pours his wrath out on this world. So if you have been waiting for something like that from the book of Revelation, go ahead and shout. That's all right. God is good and he is faithful to those who are faithful to him. The bad news there, though, is that those who are compromised and those who are believing deception very well may have to go into the great tribulation, as we see in Thyatira. He goes on to say, Behold, I come quickly. The word here means shortly, speedily, or can mean suddenly. He's coming suddenly. And he said, hold fast to that which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. He says here, I'm coming quickly or I'm coming suddenly. Hold tight to what you have. Don't let go. Don't let up. Don't compromise. Don't give in to this world. Don't, don't, don't allow yourself to be drawn away. Hold tight. That no man may take your crown. Um, Smyrna was the other church that was promised a crown. Again, the persecuted church. Promised a crown. They were told that if they were faithful unto death, they would have a crown of life. This to, to Philadelphia, this statement says, hold fast to, the, to what you have that no man take your crown. I, I believe that the receiving of the crown will come in eternity, but we already have been given, if we are faithful, we've already been given the crown. It's already mine, but I can lose it according to this. I can lose my reward. Don't want to lose my reward. I've worked too hard and too long And I don't deserve anything, but if God's going to give rewards, I want the reward that he's willing to give. And so this says, hold fast that no man take your crown. So the implication here is that our crown is already set aside for us who are faithful. And also that our reward can be stolen. Who can can steal our reward? I think really the only person that can, can, can take our reward from us is us. Our compromise. We can have other people who will, who will lead us toward compromise and they might have had a part in it, but we are told, we're the ones that, that are told to stay, stay true. And we don't, want to, we don't want to lose the rewards that God has already laid aside for us. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8 confirms that a crown is already laid up. The Apostle Paul said that to Timothy. And Colossians chapter 2 verse 18 among a lot of other scriptures talks about losing our reward after it's already been really designated for us. 
The Lord goes on to give this promise. This is the promise for faithfulness, the promise that we always look at. To him that overcometh, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, and will command, I'm sorry, I mean, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. I want us to notice a couple things here as I'm trying to move forward. The, the overcomer, the Lord says that he would make him a pillar in the temple of his God. If we read Revelation chapter 21, verse 22, John said that he didn't see a temple there. Because God and the Lamb are the temple. I told you, you can, you can look at the scripture with itself and it, it will interpret what it's talking about. So the Lord here, we, we, we see that the Lord is not just speaking of some grand temple in, in the heavenlies. He's speaking of a place in Him. Oh, wow. Wow. The word in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 says you are God's building. The, the word in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 19 says you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. The Lord looks at temples differently than we do. We call this the church, but truly we are the church. Amen. We, when we're looking at the temple, we, we might be looking for uh, some sort of grand building in the sky, but what we should be looking for is the Lamb of God and His Father. And when we see them, we see the temple. And He has secured because of his blood through our belief in him and and with our faithfulness he has secured a place for us in him and he said I will make you a pillar in the temple of my God a pillar is firm it's stable it's sound it's sturdy I don't know if you'd call this a pillar but it qualifies I can't move it. I feel it vibrating a little bit when I do that. But I can't move it because it's sturdy. It's made to stay. It's made to last. And God is speaking of his people here. And he is saying, you've been faithful. And if you continue, if you overcome, I will make you a pillar in the temple of, of my God. And he's saying, because of your faithfulness, I have secured you a place hidden in God forever. You won't go out anymore. You don't have to go out and suffer through your human struggles. You will stay in the presence of the Most High God. Remember, he's the one that has the key to let us in there. And I'll bring you into the temple of God and I will make you a pillar oh hallelujah 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 I don't ever have to go back out of his presence again I'm going to be a part of the temple I'm going to be a part of him and he's a part of me hallelujah and I will write upon him the name of my God the name of the city of my God which is New Jerusalem which comes down of out of heaven from God. And, and I, I, want, I want us to understand when we read that. He goes on to say, and I will write upon him my new name. I want us to understand, we, we talk about, and I, I'm wanting to, I don't know when I'll get to, I'm wanting to teach maybe on a Wednesday night. If you're not watching on Wednesday nights, we're having a great time on Wednesday night, 6.30, doing a lot of live videos. Some of them are pre-recorded. You can see it on the church webpage, or you can see it on Facebook. I want to preach soon if the Lord will allow me. I thought I would do it already, but I'm not, I'm not there. I'm not where I need to be yet to really relate it to you, but on, on the mark of the beast. But the mark of the beast in Revelation chapter 13 is a, it's a copycat maneuver. This right here is the real thing. We'll have the new name of the Messiah written upon our forehead. That's what the word says. And, and those who accept the mark of the beast, this says the name of my God. The, those that accept the mark of the beast in Revelation chapter 13, they're receiving the number of a man's name. So they're taking a natural mark. But those who are the followers of Jesus Christ, and that natural mark even though is a supernatural thing because they've aligned themselves with Satan. But this mark that Jesus is speaking of, he said he would write the name of his father of the new Jerusalem and I will write my new name on you. This mark 
mark is the mark that we need and we have to have. He has designated us as his own. Again, right back to having a place in God. He's putting his name on me. Just to help you get this. And I know I preached a long time, but I just can't stop. If you got to go, you can go. I dismiss you, but I got to go on. Do you remember when you were kids or when your children were little? And mama would take your coat and she would write on on the tag, Jerry. L, just in case there's another Jerry in the classroom. Do you remember that? What she was doing was was marking my property, her property, our property. She was designating that nobody else can have it. Nobody else will take it. You don't have to worry about it. It's, It's yours. It's got your name on it. Your sister can't have it. Your best friend can't have it. Somebody can't just sneak and get it because it looks like something they want. But if they try, it's got your name on it. All you got to do is say that has my name on it and they'll have to give it back. I'm telling you, God has marked you, his people, with his own name. He will place his name on you. He said, they're mine. You can't do anything about it, devil. You can't have them. You can't steal them. You can't take it. They are mine. They are mine. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So what's the Spirit saying? I can break this one down to just a real quick. He's saying, with faithfulness comes the greatest blessing. He's he's saying a lot of things, but that's the main thing he's saying. With faithfulness comes the greatest blessing. In all these other churches except Smyrna, we saw the Lord really calling them to repentance. And with Smyrna and Philadelphia, he's saying be faithful. And we see here the greatest blessing of all is to remain faithful to Jesus Christ. If we're faithful to him, he who owns the keys opens the doors. He that owns the keys locks the doors that don't need to be opened. He that owns the keys pours blessings upon us. He that owns the keys makes us a pillar, a firm foundation in the, in the house of God or in God himself that we never have to go out of his presence. And he that holds the keys, he that is the one in authority grants us access. We only have the right to that through Jesus Christ But the blessing comes with our faithfulness. So what's the Spirit saying? He's saying, church, he's saying to South Knoxville Church of God, we need to be faithful. Be faithful in your love for him, first and foremost. Be faithful in your relationships to those he's put around you. If you're married, be faithful to your spouse. He's saying be faithful to your friendships. That's difficult in these times, but do it. Be faithful to your church. That can be in attendance. It can be in giving. It can be in your mouth. Sometimes we we continue to go to a place and talk terrible about it. I'm not saying anybody here is doing that, but it happens. It happens a lot. And so we, we need to remain faithful. Be faithful in every area of your life and the favor of God will rest upon you like you have never seen it before. And it's not a temporary thing. The favor of God's eternal. Stand to your feet. Next week, Lord willing, we'll talk about Laodicea. Laodicea was the lukewarm church. I believe that most of the church is lukewarm. Lord, help us to be faithful. Lord, help us to be faithful. Bow your heads with me for just a minute. 
Father, as we come before you, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, for revelation knowledge. I thank you for the revelation of Jesus Christ. I thank you, Lord, for the truth that you've spoken to hearts today. I thank you for your call to repentance in so many of these churches and your call to faithfulness in these two. I thank you, God, for peace that even though we are frail and we have a little strength, that you, Lord, have empowered us to be faithful. Can't do it myself. That's what the little strength called to our attention. I can't do it in myself, but I can lean on you. God, help us to be faithful. And God, you said if we were faithful over a few things, you'd make us ruler over many. God, right now, if we've been unfaithful in any area, whatever it might be, anything, God, bring it to our heart. We repent of it. We're sorry, Lord, of our sin, our unfaithfulness. And we have determined to remain faithful to you unto death so that we might receive a crown of life and remain faithful to you that no one might steal our crown and remain faithful to you that we might be able to be in that closest place intimate place with you in the heavenlies the temple of God that we might not ever have to go out again we thank you we thank you Father bless each person here God, as these altars are open or they can pray at their seat, I pray, God, that you, admin, that you administer to each person. God, take us into the depths of your spirit. Take us into the depths of your heart and help us to be the church you've called us to be. In Jesus' name.